Hello and welcome to The Gathering. I am David Alt. And if you're watching this in real time, it is the Sunday before Christmas of 2021. I think we can all agree that it has been once again an unprecedented year. And as I was thinking about what to speak on this traditional holiday week, um, I wasn't drawn to pull out or to bring some curated Christmas message to you, but to speak about the observation that I have witnessed and uh, sort of gleaned from by being in the community and the circles of people that I have been in, listening to their conversations, their longings, uh, bearing witness to the challenges and the joys that they are going through. And as always, there is this commonality that goes through all of us. And, um, and so I was thinking a lot about Bell Hooks, the incredible feminist author and poet who passed away this past week. I uh, started to look through some of her writings that I had been treasured in having in my library over the years. And this one quote really drew me in. She said, but many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. Let me read that again. Many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others without using them as a means to escape. How profound. What I take from Bell Hooks's words are that at the level that we are able to be with ourselves, to love and nurture ourselves, to recognize our worth just as we emulate the worth of others, is the degree that we can sit and bear witness with other people without needing them, without having a secret agenda that enters before us into the communal space that says, what can you do for me? It's a, it's a purity, a purity that comes only by becoming accustomed to being with ourselves, not lonely, but in the aloneness or the solitude of our connection to the one. And as, as obvious as that might sound, so many of us busy ourselves or we neglect that type of profound solitude. We might even have a litany of excuses that say why we can't do it uh, because of space, because of family, because of work, because of all different types of distractions. But the truth is, is that anything that we earnestly desire, we will make space for. And so one question to ask ourselves, particularly at this time of the year, as this 2021 draws to a close, is to do a review and to say, what is it within me that I have not turned to? What is it that perhaps is so scary or so fearful within me that I have created more busyness in order to distract or turn myself from it. And now would be a beautiful time in these closing days of this year to do just that, to go and to turn to those things. I like that I have a swivel chair because that makes this <laughs> illustration perfect. To, uh, to turn to the things that we have avoided in order to sort of energetically clean them up, to look at the things that, that we are holding ourselves hostage for with regards to our own love. Because by doing that, it's not that we are just doing that for ourselves. We are doing that for community. And by community, I'm, I'm simply talking about the oneness of all of us as humans in this journey together. And so she says, but many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. And so what is the fear of being alone? It is one of the greatest illusions, just like death is an illusion. When we embark upon a spiritual path, uh, a metaphysical path, 
Uh, when we begin to dive deep into sacred literature, we become accustomed to understanding, hearing, and accepting that there is an eternality, that there is a wisdom to this thing called the soul that is eternal, that continues to go on. That this is but a blip, but a scratch on the cosmic journey that we are sharing together. And even though we may do all of those things to bring that into the forefront of our awareness, it doesn't mean that we are embodying it. It doesn't mean that we rest in the assurance of it. Because a lot of times, the fear of being alone, the fear of being a death, uh, the fear of death, all of the things that we sort of distract ourselves from, where the busyness gets birthed from, is because that illusion has taken hold. And so we live a life of prevention, trying to prevent death, trying to prevent being alone. And what that does, it's like a suction that sucks out the energy of others because we are using them as part of our prevention rather than sharing with them the joy of the journey together. And so you see self-healing, self-motivated healing, taking the responsibility to look at our fears, to turn to them, again, isn't isolated or just siloed solely for us. It makes us, it makes us a, a sort of a holistic magnet that permeates around the world and brings healing. Because then wherever we go, we bring that holistic magnetism with us. And that's what the world needs. The world, the world is hungry for more people to take that level of responsibility for their healing. And so a Christmas message, you know, when, we, when, I, when I think about the traditional story, the, the birth of the Christ child, how many times in a metaphysical or spiritual community have we heard that that child is representation of us. It is the story of us, the rebirth of our reawakening, our recommuning to the idea of our holy nature, our holy essence, our spiritual oneness. And so just as there were people who were gathering in awe and reverence, there is an energy system that is gathered around us in awe and reverence and unconditional love, no matter how much forgetfulness we participate in, no matter how much busyness we accumulate in order to avoid it. And so the greatest Christmas gift, the greatest story, is the one where we rejoice and reunite with the sacredness of ourselves. And we find a way to do that. We find a way to do some old-fashioned forgiveness for whatever missteps, for looking back over this year and, and cleaning up our sort of own uh, human backyard, if you will. Because anything that we see and project upon other people is simply a reflection of our own lens, the perception by which we are and think and do and live and be. And so bell hooks, but many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. And so we are not alone. We are one human family. We are one soul family in this human skin suit. We returned, my partner and I went to Maui this month to participate in a retreat there, um, a long-standing tradition retreat sponsored by the Love, Serve, Remember community, which is a nonprofit that curates the teachings of Ram Das. And this retreat had been going on for many, many years, and... Um, then Baba passed at the end of 2019, right around this time. And, the, and then 
COVID happened. And so there hadn't been a retreat for two years. And so this was the first one, the first one in his absence. And I, I spoke a little bit about this in other gathering videos. But there was one particular moment in the sessions that stands out to me. Exquisite, beautiful woman, Mirabai Bush. Mirabai Bush has long been a friend of Ramdas. She was there in the early days with him in India and shares many of the adventures and the stories of their guru, Maharaji. And she has been a long-standing friend of his and has co-written books with him also. And she's just a very wise sage. And so she was there. And I had the pleasure of listening to her in one session and she did an exercise that really hit home to me about all of this, about the fact that we are one. And um, I'm going to call it just like me. She had curated, written, tested uh, a long list of sentences that went something like this. So first of all, the exercise is, is that you look into the eyes of another person. And so we all did in this retreat. And you would say things like, this person has experienced sorrow just like me. This person has lost someone that they love just like me. This per person has witnessed a joy just like me. And the, the beauty of this exercise is that it, the way that she had crafted it is that each of these things got deeper and deeper and deeper. And there was one significant one that really touched me. And she said, as you're looking, imagine looking into the eyes of another person. And she said, this person will die just like me. And you could hear a pin drop in the retreat as she was leading this process because it was one of the things that created the solitude. But it was, it was a solitude not only within the self because there was this incredible reflection, but it was also a, a communal solitude where people went deep inside of themselves and saw the other person not as an other, but as an extension of themselves. And so what I, what I want to stress to you is that I know that it is noisy. I know that people are hurting. I know that perhaps you are hurting in ways that feel overwhelming, that feel... Um, unprecedented. That's what uncertainty does. It destabilizes us. And we, I'm, I'm going to just make a big general statement, we as a society, a global society, as one human family, have never experienced such extended uncertainty before. And what does that destabilization do? It brings up, brings up everything that is in need of light. It brings up everything that is a part of a collective forgetfulness in order to let that light bring it back to truth. And so that is both incredible and scary for anyone who is not accustomed to looking beyond effect. And I do not think that there is anyone that is exempt from that. Why? Because no matter how much someone might profit from this, they still have to interact with other people in the community. No matter how much one might suffer financially, physically, emotionally from this, there still is the constant requirement of community. And so 
I want you to, I want you to seriously think about this holiday. What is a gift? What is the best gift? What is the most sacred gift that any of us could give? I believe that that is the wholeness of ourselves, to be fully present. As Bell Hooks said, to know the solitary nature of our sacredness and there taste and experience the art of our own self-loving. That when we can do that, that we give that gift to other people, then what we are doing is we are seeing them. We're not using them, as she said, as a means of escape. But we are bringing the totality of our essence and who we are, and we are seeing them. We are knowing their highest and best. It can be hard sometimes to talk about things like this because it seems so high, so um, intangible. But there is a way to make these things tangible, just like that exercise of just like me. I can walk around and I can be in the grocery store at a time when grocery stores are busy. I could be in a retail situation. I could be anywhere getting gas, who knows where, what it might be, but I can look at other people and I can do the just like me exercise. I can look at them and I can say, that person has lost someone dear to them, just like me. That person is afraid of something, just like me. And all of a sudden, you can feel a healing taking place, not just within our own being, but in the dissolving of the us and them. That's a very tangible thing. So the whole idea of oneness, there is no us and them, and the intangibility of that can always be created in this sort of a reduction to bring it into the tangibility to make it true for each and every one of us. And that's the encouragement. That is the gift that I want to give to you this season. I also want to share, too, that this year, um, Nandidas, which is the nonprofit that my partner and I have created, have been putting on events. We did a retreat in the fall, but we've also been hosting a series of meetups uh, focused around the teachings of Ram Das, and we've held them in our home. We had another one last night. And a beautiful thing has happened from these meetups. And that has been the witness of young people showing up. Um, there are many, many organizations, be it church, be it, um, be it business, that are always looking for young people. How do we get more young people? I think that's the wrong strategy. How do we get more? You don't get them. You create an atmosphere where they feel welcomed. Also, too, we can take into consideration the fact that each generation is different. They're cut from, yes, they're cut from the same cloth, but they operate differently because the world continues to become different. And so what might have been the strategies or the brick and mortar appeal to other generations isn't necessarily the same thing that appeals to this generation. And so the whole idea of how to get people is very recruity. And uh, I find that young people are smart um, and they can smell being recruited. And so we, we never set out to do that. But for some reason, this... Um, broadening appeal of the teachings of Ram Das or the, the teachings of spirituality that, um, contain, or that are contained in these mystical uh, sages um, are still very much activated and alive in new generations. And so from these meetups, these young people started to show up and then they continued to come back. And now they're friends and now they wouldn't miss a meeting. And it's beautiful to witness because there's a deep intelligence and a deep devotion inside of them. There's a deep hunger for 
being in the world but not of it. There is a deep hunger to walk and to put into practice exercises like just like me and to show up fully present. And um, again, last night, I just kind of sat back and witnessed some of this genius and was so grateful that we had started what we are doing. And part of our commitment in the new year is as we continue to grow as a spiritual nonprofit, that we want to place greater, greater emphasis on allowing, creating retreats for younger people for people just like these who are showing up at the meetups and to do it um, in a way that um, meets them where they are. And um, so that's one of the ways that if you're, if you glean any um, wisdom or if you get anything from these messages or anything that we do in terms of our spiritual messaging and support, then know that a lot of your donations go to plan to make these new generation of wisdom keepers uh, feel nurtured and cared for. And that's one of the commitments of Nandidas. So this holiday, um, I see you. I see your heart. I know that you have fears, just like me. I know that you have hope and you have longings and desires, just like me. I know that you feel that there are many, many things that you would still like to do in this world, just like me. And, and I know that there is suffering that you have experienced this year, just like me. And what I also know is that there is a deep knowing. There is an eternal rest. There is the beauty of the Christ child inside of you, just like me, that awaits for the solitude, the solitary moment of communion and reconnection, and that this is afforded to you. May this be the message that we give ourselves to our friends and to our family, to the next generation of all of these beautiful souls who are now leading the torch and bringing truth in their unique and beautiful way. May you have a glorious, glorious holiday, and I'll see you next time.